Uh, SMEs definitely face challenges now, labor crunch, economic uncertainties, and SMEs itself is about 90% or 90 over percent of the registered entities in Singapore. They come in different forms, shapes and sizes, some relatively large, most are medium to small to micro enterprises. Because of that, the challenges are great. When we implement schemes and programs, sometimes one size doesn't fit all. You need to customize, not only based on the size of the company and their different phases that they are in in the business cycle, but also the sector, they in, the industry that they are in. But nevertheless, we do our best. As you know, the budget that was announced by DPM Taman, two-thirds of the 5.3 billion transition support program is expected to go to our SMEs. That's the chunk of it. That's the huge chunk of it that we'll put in. But the question would be, how do we allocate the funds and the budget to effectively being used by the SME and truly being benefited by them? And we're fully aware of the need to help them and how our SMEs succeed, even to survive in these difficult times in the economic uncertainties. So Spring IE Singapore have been working hard over the years to look at the different schemes, rolling out the different programs to help our SMEs. I have commissioned a review of all the SME programs and strategies moving forward. And it revolves around a few key outcomes, some strategies and some key trusts. Summarizing them all, it revolves around three numbers, two, three, and eight. Very auspicious. Two outcome, three broad trusts, and eight strategies. Many of the members asked about this review as well. What's the outcome of it? What do you get out of it? What kind of new programs? Well, I'm heartened to say that many of the business sector came forward in three associations, like Singapore Business Federation, the SME Committee, Chinese Chamber of Commerce and other three associations, ASME, they have all given very good suggestions. In fact, in fact many of the suggestions even went up to Ministry of Finance and they actually helped to provide some of the managers and programs that were rolled out. So I thank them all for working with us to strategize the strategies for the SMEs. Let me just share with you some of the outcomes. Two outcomes for SMEs. First, these are the two key objectives. We want a productive, vibrant, and strong SME sector. Because with that, you create good jobs. That's the second outcome. You want good jobs, good quality jobs for our Singaporeans, for our workers too. And to do so, we'll focus on helping SME along three broad trusts. Basically, for any companies to work, you look at the revenue, the top line, you look at the cost component, how you manage the cost, make it more productive, make the money work for you, and then look at the bottom line. So first, the top line, we have to tap on the opportunities for growth. Second, drive productivity, make sure it's efficient, it's effective. The money that works for you gives you that kind of return that you need to sustain your business. And the government plays its role, thirdly, to provide a conducive environment for the SMEs. We want our SMEs to do well domestically. We also want them to grow overseas. So that comes the first trust, to grow them overseas to grow them locally as well, but we want to be able to create the opportunity and to be able to let them identify them and to exploit those opportunities. First is to collaborate. And this collaboration will have to be supported by partnerships. And we call this scheme Partnerships for Capability Transformation, or PAC, P-A-C-T. And this was also requested by Ms. Lo Yin Ling. PAC currently supports large enterprises in qualifying advanced manufacturing parts and processes from Singapore-based suppliers. Many of the SMEs are actually suppliers, suppliers to MNC, suppliers to big companies. They are just network of suppliers. And the government now will expand PAC to include non-manufacturing sectors and a wider range of activities that involves collaborations between large enterprises and the SMEs. And as long as they are suppliers, and they circle around the bigger enterprises, you can work together to collaborate. Grants from EDB and Spring will now be available to both large enterprises and SMEs to facilitate these collaborations. I think many of the members actually mentioned that. So first, large enterprises could transfer their knowledge and share best practices to SMEs in the course of supplier sourcing. 
So whether it's supply sourcing, outsourcing practices and operations, they collaborate together. And this will help SMEs to improve their productivity. Many a times, it's either the core of it, which is the large enterprise that the supplier supplies to, that actually comes up with some state-of-the-art thinking or more advanced way of doing certain things, product development, logistics or operations, in order to be more competitive, the supplier benefits from that. We want that to be collaborated, so there's a program to help them partner together. For example, local department store Metro embark on a mobile POS and supplier integration project to upgrade its productivity. Nine of Metro's SME suppliers were also upgraded as they had to build their competencies to integrate with Metro's system. That helps to actually automate or computerize some of the processes between the supplier and the big company, so in this case Metro. And then the process will be more seamless and automated. That helps in the productivity drive of the small enterprises. Another form of collaboration is for the SMEs to come together to develop and test innovative new solutions with large enterprises. Some members have mentioned how do we put in IT together for the different smaller enterprises. So it can be driven by these large enterprises to help the small enterprises to computerize. So one example would be the recent tie-up between local medical technology firm AWOC Technologies and US medical giant Baxter International to develop and commercialize a wearable artificial kidney. And through these partnerships and collaborations, our SMEs can grow and their capabilities will be strengthened and widened. This is important because as they collaborate, opportunities are vast. When the suppliers and the SMEs develop that kind of capabilities, some of them can be exported. Some of these capabilities can actually go overseas. As MS Lee mentioned about the MRI, which is the Market Readiness Accessibility Overseas. A few members mentioned that how can large companies and small companies come together from consortium and look for opportunities overseas. This is how it works. You can't look at the scheme by itself. Let's say you want the big and small companies to come together. It can be under pack, coming together, collaborate, and then look forward tapping on the scheme of MRA, Market Readiness Accessibility, develop the agents network or market reps ne network out there. So two schemes together, it develops an opportunity as a whole, as they compete overseas. So when the schemes are combined together, many companies will benefit. So no one scheme can work alone. If you collaborate, integrate them together, it gives a greater benefit. And we also have schemes where we try to develop our local more promising enterprises to go overseas, and that's a global company partnership as we handhold them to look at where the opportunities. Some individual companies can be identified as star player, and they can actually grow their footprints and network overseas, market their products and services overseas as well. This is where IE Singapore will customise some of their approaches, help them to go overseas. Under the second trust, productivity, innovation and capability upgrading, we'll look at the cost component. How can they drive productivity improvements within the company? We look at their business model, their operating model, and to make sure that the cost that they're investing within the company itself will actually give them the returns that they need, and to make sure that the money works for them. So under the second trust of this SME review, we'll enhance support for the SME in productivity, innovation, and capability upgrading. And to advance beyond that, the, comp the government will continue to support companies in capability upgrading. Though last year, more than 5,600 companies benefited from capability upgrading projects supported by Spring and IDA. And more SMEs can now tap on PIC bonus, can now tap on the PIC vouchers too. For the micro-enterprises, micro the smaller ones, PIC vouchers will be absolutely suitable and relevant. These are smaller scale amount, $5,000. And on top of that, with the PIC bonus, they actually get a return to their investments in assets or equipments that helps them in productivity. And very importantly, within the cost component, cost component of the enterprise will be the manpower and the talent. And many have spoke about that, about these talents. And right now with the labor crunch, both at the mid-level to the lower level, how do you find this talent? I think we're especially concerned over the managerial level as well and the supervisory level. So we suggested that we can actually continue the education of our current SME workers to provide a pipeline for our SMEs. So current SME workers, you continue to upgrade them, which is reskilling, 
upgrading their knowledge. And to enhance the human capital of SMEs, Spring will also offer a suite of assistance to help SMEs groom their business leaders. For example, advanced management program co-funds soft courses for SME CEOs through executive MBAs and executive development courses. And this is where the bosses go back to school to learn strategic planning, learn how to run their business more efficiently. And to strengthen the SME's middle management, the Management Development Scholarship co-funds scholarships for promising executives currently in the SMEs to pursue MBAs and part-time degrees. And support is also available from LDDA and MOM for older workers to upgrade their skills. It was also mentioned SME Talent Scheme, which many members were interested. SME Talent Schemes is to make sure that there's a strong and deep collaboration between the IT and the polytechnic with the SME sector. Many of the graduating students or students in this institution may not have that kind of interest to join the SME sector. They may not feel that it gives them that kind of career path that is clear. It doesn't give them uh, stability. On the contrary, SME sector could provide them the opportunity to be entrepreneurial and also to broaden their experience in business. I have actually had a dialogue with poly students and when I explained to them the SME's appeal, and they, got, they didn't see that side of the, the drawing power of the SME's. For example, if the talents are fit into the SME, many of these SME will consider this talent as their rare talent in their company, and not unlike big companies where they join a group of them. So whatever opportunities to go overseas, set up subsidiary, venture abroad, do market assessment, you'll be given to that talent. And I think that exposes the person tremendously, broaden the horizon tremendously for the business sector itself and to run the company. So not only are you going to do certain functions that you've been trained in or that you started in and got your diploma or your IT certificate from, you are going to broaden it. So if you are an accounting graduate from Polytechnic or accounting in IT, you go into an SME, you not only just do finance or accounting, but you'll get the chance to do sales, marketing, operations, IT, all across the board. And when I talk to SME bosses, definitely they are most welcome for these talents to experience all of it because it's, not com it's always difficult to draw talents and they want to retain them. So we roll out this SME talent scheme to actually fit as many of the talents as possible into the SME sector to encourage our local graduates, our local talents to actually venture out into with the SMEs and to be able to grow and broaden their horizon within that sector. That will strengthen our SME sector as a whole. And that's where we actually try to target as many of the uh, poly graduates as possible. SME talent scheme will be made available for every single year of the institution IT and every single year of the polytechnic. So it's not just a graduating year, but it's also from the first year, entry year, second year, third year, depending on the course and depending if they are keen. Allowance, training will all be paid. The Germans has the apprenticeship program. And then all of us would know that there's a scholarship program that is quite widely available in Singapore. So as any talent scheme positions between the apprenticeship as well as the scholarship program. It gives assurance of a job. It pays for you even when you're studying. And at least you will have not just an internship but traineeship during your holidays to be actually working in the SME itself. And Ms. Lo Yen Ling has actually mentioned about the more, well, the golden years of any workers and 60 become 40. And, and we, we truly believe that. We want everybody to be actively aging and also contributing back to the economy. There are many of the current schemes as well. One of the schemes is a business advisory program. Business advisory program facilitates a process for the very experience. Maybe you're working in MNC, or you're working in another function, but you want to make a picnic career switch. Through the business advisory program, we actually match you with an SME for you to provide certain advisory role in the SMEs before you could be employed full time. But if you can find the chemistry right and the right company, and the company find this is the right person, appropriate person, then can do the match up and immediately being employed permanently. So the business advisory program is one program that a mid-career chief individual or executive can consider. And let me come to the question on productivity. 
Uh, Mrs. Lina Chum's question on plant and machinery. The PIC bonus announced at budget allows companies to receive up to 15,000 cash over three years. I've mentioned that already. And that's on top of the tax deduction they already enjoy from productivity investments that qualify for PIC. And I encourage SMEs to tap on other kind of programs as well. It's not just PIC bonus, but really SMEs really have to relook at their business model and see what are the kind of schemes that's suitable for them and would not just look at one scheme or two. So which credit scheme, for example, it cannot be looked at it in isolation. Which credit scheme should be looked at from the productivity angle as well? How productive can they be? Have they hit the certain indicators within the company before you want to talk about increasing pay and put the wage credit in place? But there's only three years that you can work on. So there's a lot of urgency. But a combination of schemes gives you the most benefit. And we want to encourage SME to tap on that and to really review and relook into it. Government can only do so much because the SMEs has the domain knowledge to know what they need. And that's where we need the SME to come forward to look at the review their own model. So we also encourage SMEs to tap on this collaborative industry project program, which will help the sectors as a whole to improve their productivity through shared services and other innovative solutions. And one of the initiatives under IDA's iSprint is to drive CIPs for Infocom technology solutions. And with iSprint funding, for example, Boogie Street Development implemented an integrated point of sale, inventory control and cashless payment system for 800 retail shops at Boogie Street. And this allowed the retailers to decrease the cost of technology adoption to due, due to economies of scale while improving productivity and customer service at the same time. I believe the member, Mr. Jerome Yam, has actually mentioned that about putting in IT as a whole. And this is one program where they can come together, industry focus. And a lot of the projects to be successful, you need a very proactive trade association also to take the lead as well, or a cluster of companies coming together and to drive it and say that we, have, we can do some of these things and centralise. So there were centralised kitchen that we experimented before. You actually have centralised logistic services in the past as well. So many of the outsourcing services make these things possible. Collaborative effort where they all achieve economies of scale. And this is extremely important for even the micro enterprises. The micro prices as a whole, the heartland stores in the community, all of them, they can actually come together and see maybe some stores come together and look at procurement. Some stores come together and look at joint promotions. There are many of these that is possible. And that's exactly where later on I'll come into to say, to roll out the SME centres that will help network some of these things to make it possible to work with the businesses to make this collaboration possible. That's SME. In meeting the challenges in business, some may be successful, others may not. And we constantly need renewal of the business sector. New enterprises need to be injected and need to grow, and we need new products as well. So every time when, when we have entrepreneurship projects, we will do our best to support, and hopefully some of them can become, well, some brilliance and spark of brilliance somewhere where the products or services become global, and we, we can actually produce other, other global champions and regional champions in our business sector. So Mr. Singh and Mr. Vikram Nair has actually mentioned us how we can develop startups and the entrepreneurship spirit in our youth. Developing innovative startups will remain an important focus, even as part of this economic restructuring. I've cited many of the helps that the startups can be productive or can tap on the schemes. Uh, in ACE, where I chair Action Community for Entrepreneurship, we have grants that has been given out the grants used to be a year startup grant that's for those below 20 years of 26, 26 years and below. But we have since opened up to actually benefit as many startups as possible. And uh, it has no age limit. It doesn't have to be technologically focused. As long as you have a good idea, you're competitive, and you have a differentiation, we'll be there to grant you as best I can, as many as possible. But for entrepreneurship culture, it has to go beyond the grant. It has, we have to build an ecosystem and a conducive environment for people to want to start business. And the business sector must be exciting enough, and the consumer market in Singapore has to be exciting enough to be able to set up those businesses. And we need passionate individuals. So we need to inculcate that, even when they're younger. So ACE this year has rolled out a program where we have entrepreneurs adopt school program. The entrepreneurs can adopt their old school when, we, when they are alumni, and they actually uh, get involved into an entrepreneurship education within the school. We're piloting with a few schools, and we have seen uh, very good feedback from entrepreneurs who are involved 
and actually go into the classes to teach them about risk taking and the students get attached to the entrepreneurs themselves. And for the startups that's already in place, one example is the startup launch pad. We provide the facilities uh, where we could. And one very famous location is Ayar Raja Block 71. That has now become sort of a test bathing center for new products, in fact, for the startups too. And they are jointly initiated by JTC and MDA in 2011. And besides the tangible assistance from space provided, Block 71 also provides intangible synergies by creating a vibrant startup community for networking and collaboration. The networking and collaboration for the startups, to me, are the first and primary most important. In business, it's about your network, who you know, what you know, and where are the business opportunities. So mentorship is a focus where we put in, and also developing platforms where we link capitalists to the startups so that they can get their Series A funding, they get a second Series funding to be injected into the business for new capital. On cultivating young entrepreneurs, as I mentioned, we start them young, we go into the schools, and also in the universities as well. Universities and polytechnics have incubators. These incubators encourage the startups or encourage students to start their business and they incubate for a period of time, and hopefully they graduate into the marketplace. And some of them, during the incubation period, already went to the marketplace to try to test demand of their products and services. And they can continue to refine and tweak the best they can. And over there, they have mentors to help them so that they try and error. But this is not a rosy picture. Any startups, the probability is that more than half may not succeed. And that's one thing that we have to teach our young, which is that if they embark on a journey of entrepreneurship, it's about learning about failures and not always wealth and successes. Learning about failures, come back stronger and more resilient and try again. And that's where we should be coming from. And that's the best educational value of entrepreneurship. Mr. Lin Piao Chuan has asked MTI to review regulations on timeshare products, the main legislation protecting consumers against errant timeshare companies today is the Consumer Protection Act, or CPFTA. And under the CPFTA, case may obtain injunction orders against errant traders for unfair practices such as misleading claims and pressure selling, or consumers themselves may take civil action against them. And besides the CPFTA, the police can also take action against fraudulent timeshare companies under the penal code. I announced at MTI's COS last year that we will review the CPFTA, and since then we have sought inputs from CASE and completed a study of overseas legislation in this industry to come up with a series of proposed amendments. So this would include disallowing the collection of deposits during the cooling off period and requiring sellers to provide key information on the contract before the consumers sign it. Madam Chairman, the government remains fully committed to support our SMEs in restructuring and the transition will not be easy because this is economic uncertainties and I continue to urge our companies to take advantage of the assistance that the government and work together towards achieving quality growth. And enterprises of any types can come forward, look at the schemes, look at their business model and continuously review what exactly is most suitable for them to be able to get stronger. If they continue to face constraint, and for some, in, for some companies, well, you want them, you encourage them to be in a productive movement, but they felt that it takes a much longer time, and we understand. However, they have to take that first step. If they're willing to take that first step, the schemes will always be there to help them. Mr. Zaki Mohammad has mentioned about social enterprises, and I want to assure Mr. Zaki that uh, social enterprises included, because they are enterprise as a whole, and they are registered as an enterprise, so they can still tap on the scheme. Social, social enterprise is one of the most hardest organizations to run because you have both a social cost and the price. But first and foremost, your business model must be viable and sustainable. And to be commercially viable, then you can be able to earn that kind of return and sustain yourself to meet your social mission. And that's very difficult. But we treat social enterprises as an enterprise itself, and they can continue to tap on the scheme as well. Let me lastly just encourage companies to continue to look at the different schemes. I know that there's quite massive schemes out there, but we would like the SME centres uh, within this year itself. We hope to roll out as many SME centres as we can. Currently, plan is about five SME centres as a hub and satellite centre as spokes. So these satellite centres will be within the community itself where the big SME centres will be one-stop shop 
that will be initiated and developed by the trade associations. Some of the members have asked for centres to be uh, situated or located within a constituency. The Ms. Jessica Tan, uh, Mr. Sito Yipin, and uh, Ms. Fatima Latif has actually mentioned that they would like some SME centres to be located there. Well, we will study it, and I think uh, there's a possibility that uh, an office or a satellite centre can be situated there, and we'll work with the three associations to do that. And I think it's important for the community, the business sector and the government to all work together in these difficult times, in this transitioning process as the economic restructure, and we'll go through that every step of the way in this journey. Thank you.